Well, uh, <coughs> good morning everyone and welcome to this session on refractive surgery A to Z. Uh, I am Dr. Maipal Sajdev, Chairman Medical Director, Center for Site Group of Higher Hospitals. I have with me the uh, convener, Dr. Shri Ganesh, whom you all know, uh, heads the Netradhama. And uh, I have with me Dr. Vardhman Kankaria, young, budding, upcoming uh, surgeon, Asian Eye Hospital in Pune and Ahmednagar. So without much ado, thank you. Without much ado, we will just uh, uh, start in case uh, the other chairpersons and moderators come, I will ask them to join. Uh, Dr. Nishant Patel doesn't seem to be here, so we'll go on to the second talk of the session and that is visual and refractive results with Vizumax 800. First 1000 eyes. We all know Dr. Shri Ganesh loves technology, mobikes and motorcycles. But and my uh, friends. And, and my friends. like And my friends. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but I think he is a, really a gifted surgeon and uh, really knows uh, how to uh, get the best out of technology. Don't start uh, that time. Which we could even. see yesterday and uh, I think he was also involved with the trials for the development of the Vizumax 800. So who else than uh, Dr. Shri Ganesh to talk about visual and refractive results of Vizumax 800. Thank you, Dr. Maipal. Good morning, dear friends. And uh, I would like to present our results uh, of the first thousand eyes uh, with the Visimax 800. We were part of the global trials for the 800. And I am a consultant to Carl's eyes uh, and biotech. So if you look at the workflow of the Visimax 800 and how it is different from the 500, you have a laser arm that dis descends, you select the treatment, and then here the you that is attaching the pi and here instead of the bed moving up like the 500 the laser arm moves it also has a top and side camera view so that you can actually adjust the pi onto the patient's uh, cornea by looking at the cameras and then this is the infrared uh, to have the centration guide so this visimax 800 has a centration guide where you can center on the visual axis and that is how it's different from the 500 you can see that there is, it shows you if you are away from the visual axis, that's a cord which you have to shorten and then you can dock on the visual axis. It also has cyclotorsion adjustment, but you have to mark the 0, 180 degrees and then by rotating the joystick, you can actually rotate the axis of placement of the treatment and so you can compensate for static cyclotorsion. And the laser itself is much faster. It is a 2 megahertz laser. So the laser in real time takes about 8 seconds for a 6 mm zone and 10 seconds for a 6.5 mm zone. The laser arm goes up and the microscope arm comes down. It's robotic arms which are... And you can see that is the dissection. The laser pattern itself is very nice without OBL and then you have a smooth dissection. So the treatment time is greatly reduced. Coming to the uh, results, total number of eyes operated 1036, two weeks follow-up available for 870 eyes. We used a nomogram, uh, same as the 500, 10% overcorrection for sphere, 15% overcorrection of, for cylinders with the rule, 10% overcorrection for oblique cylinders and for against the rule astigmatism, no correction. Our average age of patients was uh, 27.4. The uh, spherical equivalent treated was minus 4.21 and uh, cylinder was about one diopter. The uh, pre, uh, corrected distance visual acuity pre-op was uh, minus 0 0.08 logmar and uh, we also looked at, we used an average optical zone of 6.3. We also did the HD analyzer and the pre-op average OSI was 0.65. And if you look at the post-op outcomes at uh, two weeks, uh, you can see that uh, uh, between the first day and then uh, 15 days, the uncorrected uh, distance visual acuity didn't change much. It was excellent, uh, 0 0.03 minus 0 0.03, that is better than 6.6 on day one, maintained at uh, 15 days. Uh, residual sphere on day one was uh, 0 0.0016, so excellent correction, almost plano. 
cylinder, residual cylinder minus 0 0.019, uh, spherical equivalent point minus 0 0.0082 and uh, corrected uh, distance visual acuity minus 0 0.37 which is uh, similar to the pre-op but at 15 days minus 0 0.1 which is actually better. The OSI on day one, uh, you see from pre-op 0.65, it increased to 1.52, but still acceptable. Anything below 1.5 is good. And at 15 days, it was 0 0.96. This is a 15-day post-op uh, results. 99% of the eyes were better than 2020. Uh, you can see that. And 100% uh, uh, of the eyes better than 2025. So the efficacy index was excellent, 1.23. And if you look at the safety index, it is 1.08. If it's more than one, it's very good. So 84%, no change. 11% gained one line and 5% lost one line. There were no uh, eyes that lost more than two lines of best corrected visual acuity. This is the spherical equivalent attempted versus achieved. And you can see that uh, the scatter is uh, very good, quite tight around the um, central line. And this is the post-op spherical equivalent, 99% uh, were within half a diopter. So very good refractive accuracy and 100% within one diopter. And this is the refractive astigmatism. Uh, again, correction is better because of the cyclotorsion compensation and the nomograms used. 98% less than 0.5 adapters and 100% within one diopter of cylinder. You can see that 92% within a quarter of uh, diopter of cylinder. And this is the stability over time, but this is only 15 days, so it's not very significant. If you look at the OSI also, uh, Pre-op was 0 0.65, it reduced to 1.52 on day one, and again 15-day post-op it was 0 0.96. So the quality of vision, it shows the scatter. The, if the scatter increases, then the quality of vision is less. If it's more than 1.5, then it affects the quality of vision of the patient. But you can see here that even on day one, it's fairly acceptable. This is some of the examples of the HD analyzer with the OSI. Pre-op OSI 0 0.5, post-op day one, Hardly any change, 0 0.6, you can see that the MTF is quite good. And 15 days, it's actually better than the pre-op, 0.2. This is another patient pre-op, 0.4, you can see the point spread function. First day, 1.4, it is worsened, but 15 days, it's again 1.1. So the scatter actually is not that much. So to conclude, the Visimax 800 is the latest femtosecond laser to perform smile for myopia. And hyperopia will be shortly available. We conducted the global trials for hyperopia also. Lenticule extraction technique is the same as the Visimax 500, which is an established technique with proven clinical results. Now, if you ask me whether there's a difference between the 500 and 800 in terms of refractive and uh, visual results, we did a comparative, randomized comparative study, 1i500, 1 1i800, 1 and we did not find any difference in terms of visual and refractive results between the 500 and 800. But the only advantages of the 800 is that it is faster, it just takes 8 seconds compared to 25 seconds of the 500 and it's got surgeon supporting functions for centration and al alignment. So it's never been easier to start with smile, it's much easier for the beginners. And the two-week post-op results demonstrate excellent correction, visual outcomes in terms of efficacy and uh, significant improvement in uncorrected distance visual acuity, corrected distance visual acuity, and the uh, OSI. So the quality of vision also is very good. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, Any questions? for uh, Dr. Shri Ganesh? So Shri, uh, uh, basically from uh, the perspective of uh, this particular machine, uh, the marking is still required for cyclotron. Yeah, so 0 and 80 degree marking you have to do, but then uh, I think shortly in the next software upgrade, it will take the image from the IOL Master 700, so you have an automated uh, cyclotorsion okay. and a markerless system. Did you really find a significant difference between marking for astigmatism and not marking? Between yes, that was a study which we published in the JRS and uh, all cylinders, whether it's a toric IOL or whether it is LASIK or with uh, smile have to be on axis. If your cylindrical correction is not on axis for 
10% of um, uh, rotation of the cylinder, you lose 30% of your correction. And at 30 degrees, you lose all the correction and it becomes worse if it's more than 30 degrees. That's a known fact. It's undisputable. So why would you not want to place the cylinder on axis? Even spectacle glasses, if you rotate your glasses, your vision is terrible. So you can have loss of best corrected vision, you can have poor quality of vision if your cylinder is not on axis. So we actually define, I also have a smile marker which is available from Epsilon to mark the cornea and then compensate. So we describe this technique of rotating the cone on the 500 but with the 800 you can use the joystick and then shortly you will have automated rotation. So, See it is significant in about 8% of patients. So if you look at the overall, there's a globalization, you may think it's not that much difference. But if you look at one individual patient who has like a 12 degree rotation and a high cylinder, like a three cylinder, yes, that patient is going to be very unhappy. But when you look at the whole statistics, thousands of eyes and then 8% with significant cyclotorsion, it may not make that much of difference. But for that individual patient, yes, it will make a difference. So there were approximately, I would say, three major uh, uh, criticisms for uh, the smile procedure specifically in the FDA trial because that the energy utilization etc was uh, not optimal etc. So the first thing was slow recovery of vision. Uh, so I just from the point of view of audience I am just asking so how many of your patients uh, achieve 20-20 or 6-6 vision the next day? You see it's 99 percent almost which have Okay, so and uh, is there any difference between 500 and 800 as regards? We did record? a randomized comparative study, 1i yeah. 800, 1i uh, 1 right. 500, yeah. and we found that in terms of visual outcomes and refractive outcomes, there was no difference because even with the 500, we did the cyclotorsion compensation and the centration depending upon the visual axis on the atlas. So we found that there was no difference between the 500. The only thing that the 800 is more sophisticated, it's faster and it's got surgeon supporting features so you don't have to manually adjust it but otherwise as far as uh, yes the difference is about 15 seconds so basically the first criticism uh, i uh, kind of uh, second what he's saying is the first criticism being uh, about visual recovery being slow is no longer valid uh, it was there in fda because the energy that was being used was much higher than the optimum that was to be used the second was obviously the cyclotorsion compensation, which possibly led to suboptimal results in astigmatism. So, and they didn't uh, have I any nomograms. They didn't yeah. use any nomograms. Adjustment. They didn't have energy optimization. Yeah. The optical zones were fixed. The spot spacing and uh, was different from what is being used yeah. Yeah. universally. It was much smaller, and so all these things led to uh, poorer yeah. results than what we get internationally. And the third thing which was there was essentially uh, uh, regarding the surgical proficiency required to remove the lenticule. So do you feel uh, uh, it's still difficult for people to adjust to getting the lenticule removed? Uh, I think surgical technique, it is a surgical procedure. It is, uh, the learning curve is a little more than LASIK and definitely more than PRK. So you need some amount of surgical finesse. So if you are meddling in the interface for a long time, you will have more inflammation and edema and uh, visual recovery will be delayed. So surgical finesse and technique definitely contribute to early visual recovery. Thank you. Thank you. KP, come. Welcome, Dr. Bharti. Welcome, KP. Uh, Dr. Bharti. Yes. Good morning and with your kind request, you are in between my two talks, so I'll, can I do both of them together? Good morning and why not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I have my slides, please? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we basically being talk, going to talk about the lenticule-based uh, surgery which is there and I am just going to give you a brief overview, though Dr. Shri Ganesh has already talked about the 800. Uh, I'll give you a brief overview on uh, what are the present technologies that are available for refractive lenticule uh, extraction. So from a basics, uh, I think uh, uh, all of you know that uh, the SMILE procedure stands for small incision lenticule extraction and it consists of four steps. So there are four steps on creating the lenticule which has been shown. So the first step is essentially the posterior part of the of the 
uh, of the lenticule, the second is the side cut, the third is the top uh, which is called the cap and the fourth is the entry cut. So, this is what it is. Now, just I uh, will be talking about it subsequently, but just look at this. This is a plano convex lenticule. So, this is something which is important uh, because uh, a biconvex lenticule has been introduced and for which uh, the amount of spherical abrasion etcetera that is being, uh, uh, being got is much, much less. Now, these are the, para these are the present uh, 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 machines that are available, Visumax 500, uh, I do not think there is any specific talk on that, but Visumax 800 uh, Dr. Shiri Ganesh has uh, talked about. Uh, Dr. Bharti has come, he will be talking about the LDV, right Bharti? You will be talking about the Zemer. Yes. Yes. So, he will be talking about the Zemer. I do not think there is any speaker on ATOS, but uh, I think there are two machines in India, if I am not mistaken. Two or one? One is in NN? Uh, yeah, two. Second? One in uh, uh, Sorry? Anyway, so there is uh, one or two machines. Uh, there are two machines possibly. A uh, lot of work on the ATOS has been done uh, in our neighboring country by Pradhan, uh, that is Nepal. And then you have the launch uh, commercial availability, which is uh, on the Elita, which is the Johnson Johnson system. Uh, these are now, I think, about four units, uh, though the first uh, uh, patient that was done was in 2018, and that was on the flap. And then uh, again, uh, uh, it was India which did the studies. So both for Visumax. 500 which Rupal was uh, participating and now 800 which Dr. Rupal Shah and uh, Shri Ganesh did. Uh, I think uh, Bharti has given a lot of data on the Zemer and uh, ATOS has come out of Nepal and uh, the studies on Elita have come out of the Indian subcontinent that is Centrophosite and then NN. So, I think it is uh, really proud that uh, India is taking the leap forward in bringing on the table globally uh, these lenticule extraction uh, platforms. Well, the source of laser is approximately all, uh, all at the same, that is 1043. Now, when you look at the pulse repetition rate, what you are seeing is that the newer lasers which are coming in have a higher repetition rate. That means that they move faster. So, if you look at the first one, which was the 500, it was only 500 kilohertz. You have gone up to 2 and you have gone up to 20 and this is uh, 10. So, uh, this can, uh, the Zemer can go up to 20. But overall, uh, the time taken for the procedures has gone down significantly. So, from 30 seconds, uh, it has gone down to 10 seconds and 16 seconds. So, these are the fastest lasers uh, which are there, the Visumax 800 and uh, the Elita. Uh, the energy per pulse has also significantly dropped. And if you see that the least amount of energy that is uh, being dropped uh, has uh, goes on to the cornea is only 50 to 70 nanojoules. And what does this translate to? This translates to clearer cornea day one. It translates to better visual and a faster visual recovery because collateral damage with a higher energy is, is obviously less. Now, the patient interface in three of the machines are curved, uh, starting from the Visumax as also the Schwind. So, that uh, kind of makes a little difference in the outcomes and you have flat interfaces in both the uh, Zemer as also the Alita system which is there. Cyclotorsion compensation was not there in the 500, but uh, manually you could do it, but all these systems again are having cyclotorsion compensation which could be manual or automatic and centration system has been, uh, is there which is uh, again uh, something that is required. Uh, lenticular geometry uh, side cut, uh, except in the Zemer, which I think Dr. Bharti will say, there are uh, two entries, one which uh, goes with the anterior plane and the other which goes into the posterior plane. And similarly, in Schwind, the lenticular side cut is not there. So, this is uh, the clear, which is the corneal lenticular extraction by uh, advanced refractive, for advanced refractive outcomes. I will uh, not talk much about it, but this is uh, what Dr. Bharti will be talking about. So, this is uh, the machine. The advantage of this is that this also has the femto cataract in it and it is a portable machine. So, this is the two advantages, the rest vis-a-vis uh, -vis how it works, etc. I think I will leave it to Dr. Bharti. Uh, Visumax, you all know this is a sleek looking machine, futuristic. This is the 800 which uh, Shri Ganesh has shown you and this is the Centra line and the cyclotorsion compensation that you can have. 
in this particular machine. Now let's come on to the place where uh, I have done the maximum work uh, is the silk which stands for small incision or they prefer to call it smooth incision lenticule keratomyelosis. Uh, it's a new investigational device uh, I would say but uh, this slide actually needs to be updated because it has got CE clearance. It is available in uh, Asian countries, Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia and it is now available in India also. Uh, the advantage of this is that it creates fast and smooth cuts for easy lenticular removal and induces minimal tissue disruption in the stroma which is there. And uh, this I think, uh, I don't know how many of you were there in the live surgery but this is uh, what was shown yesterday also. These are uh, uh, two simultaneous images uh, which you can see. This is a two-piece PI, that's the machine which you saw. The microscope is not inbuilt in the machine, so you have to have your own microscope. I think it's the same for Zimmer, right? They don't have an inbuilt microscope. Uh, this is those who have uh, worked on the intralase. This is pretty much similar to the intralase. It's a two-piece uh, PI. You can see this is the PI which uh, you use the grabber. And you can see that you bring down the, uh, the entire machine. Uh, you go into the area where you have to now press on the grabber. You can see I'm opening the grabber. And once you open the grabber, you can see that the docking on the machine, uh, on the eye or the cornea happens and this is the applanation which is happening. Uh, if we go forward, I'll just uh, show you this is again, uh, you have to mark the cornea centrally in the manual and like in the interlace in this uh, spot, you can actually change, you can see I'm changing the centration. This is 0, 180 and you can see this is a cyclotorsion compensation that we are doing. So you have a mark which can be seen and you can do the cyclotorsion compensation which is there. Uh, so once that has been done, the machine uh, from a perspective of the laser, this is 16.6 seconds as you can see. Uh, this is the posterior uh, part of the uh, lenticule, this is the side cut and then uh, you can see that uh, this is the uh, uh, cap and this is the uh, entry cut that has happened which has been completed. Uh, the, the, this is how it looks and uh, we are going to show you an OCT guided image. Uh, you can see that the entry is very, very smooth because if you saw it goes over the entry, see how smooth it is, it goes over the entry pretty, uh, it goes for about every 10 microns it keeps going down. So if you have it goes about 8 to 10 times and then you can see here this is the central mark that I was talking about and you will see that the amount of dissection is negligible. So that is uh, the thing, you can see the side marks which are there and see there is hardly any dissection that you are doing and what is the reason for this? The spot size is only 1 microns and there is no spot separation and there is no line separation. That means that they are adjacent to each other. Uh, I uh, uh, personally feel that maybe we can do a 1 micron spot separation which can help and you can see even the posterior one which you can see even on the OCT. And uh, this is uh, uh, very easy to kind of uh, dissect out and this is the lenticule which comes out and on measuring if I wanted a 6.2 lenticule I will get a 6.2 lenticule and you can spread it. During the study there has been zero incidence of any retained lenticule, there has been zero incidence of any suction loss. As of now and possibly in the future also there may not be a rescue mechanism if you lose suction because it's a biconvex lenticule. So both the surfaces of the lenticule are refractive. That's the difference as compared to a Visumax. So that could be a problem that you might have to convert it into a flap uh, or you may postpone it and do it subsequently. So uh, these are uh, the important things which uh, one is the dissection techniques uh, have become less uh, kind of difficult because uh, there is almost zero dissection or negligible dissection that you have. Uh, addressing astigmatism has been taken care of. Uh, there is, uh, uh, as of now, I would personally also wish the manual thing to go on to automated as uh, Shiri was saying. Uh, there is no circle software so far and complications mean suction loss uh, which is there which should uh, look at that particular thing. Now when you are looking at these uh, uh, lenticule assisted machines, this is what I will just, because this is common for everybody, uh, let us just look at what is known as the meniscus sign. 
uh, this is for removal of the lenticle. I've just given you a brief overview of the machines. So if you see this, this comes like a meniscus. That means there's like a mouth which is opening when you are going into both the planes. So if you are going into the uh, posterior plane, as you can see here, you can see that this is a meniscus that has been created and this has been described by Titial et al. from uh, Ames RP Center. Now this is also a thing which has, uh, this has been described by Susan. Uh, Jacob, etc. And you can see that this is called as a white ring sign. So this again, the white ring will help you decide that where is the posterior, where is the lenticule, the top and the posterior. So this is something. And then there is, this is, uh, this has been described by uh, Gitansha Sachdev and all, at all. So this is, you can see when you go in into one plane and you go in into the second plane, you can see, can you see this? This is stop sign. That means that there is a it is not in the same plane, so you have a stop sign. So this is something that has been described. If you are in the same plane, uh, then you will not have, then uh, it will be. Uh, innovative uses of lenticule, I'll just be talking about two things. This is tailored stromal expansion. What we have used the lenticule, again described by us, uh, our group, is that uh, nowadays there is adaptive fluence that has come. But when this was described way back in 2015, we didn't have machines. Uh, for corneal cross-linking, even now it is a withdraw basically which is uh, looking at doing adaptive fluence. There if the corneas were thin, what do you do? You could damage the endothelium. So for the time when you are doing the cross-linking, at that particular time we would put this lenticule of, of uh, adequate thickness. So it is not like a contact lens that you are putting of a fixed uh, thickness, but you are doing it of tailored stromal expansion. That means that if I, I need a lenticule of 60 microns or 50 microns, I could take a patient <coughs> who was undergoing smile and use that, put it onto the cornea. And you can see this is uh, just to show you that we always do epi off. Uh, so you can uh, see that we do epi off, put the lenticule here and then do the cross linking. Uh, this is uh, something again, uh, this is intracorneal ring segment implantation. We have used the lenticule. This has been published in AJO and now it is going to be published long term results of uh, intracorneal ring segments uh, in thin corneas using smile lenticule for cross linking. So this has also been uh, used. This is uh, Shri Ganesh who is here. He has used the uh, lenticule uh, to uh, actually work on hyperopia. That means that you have a myopic lenticule, you create a pocket and put that according to the power as you can see here and get good results with this. Uh, for uh, uh, this thing uh, again for keratoconus to flatten the cornea that also has been described as the use of the lenticule. So these are a uh, couple of things I think uh, from a refractive standpoint there is rapid evolution uh, for the lenticular uh, base surgeries as also you can have innovative uses of uh, the lenticule and get uh, great outcomes for various other diseases. Uh, so the take home points is that the world of refractive lenticule extraction is undergoing dramatic and drastic changes. Current platforms have upgraded and upcoming ones are on the horizon. And these uh, have attracted more surgeons to shift to the lenticular based procedures. If you look at China, if you look at Korea, if you look at Taiwan, if you look at Hong Kong, you look at Singapore, uh, maybe Singapore to a slight less extent, but even uh, all these countries, uh, the go-to procedure is lenticule. Uh, the eczema laser is kind of uh, required still to do hyperopia or for redo if you need, but that's sitting by the side. So that they have totally converted onto the lenticule and uh, in India also I think the first lenticule procedure was done about 15 years ago. And the results are fantastic uh, in the lenticular based surgeries. So thank you very much for this particular presentation. Any questions for this or? Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Are there any questions uh, from the uh, panel or from the audience? I think I just want to add to that comparison, Maipal, uh, yeah. about the optics. How the optics of the Visumax is different from the other machines, including the the Schwinn, the okay. uh, Zimmer, uh, because Zeiss has a full field optic. Okay. Uh, none of the other machines have a full field optic. They have partial field optic. That means you have a, a various lens lenslets because the manufacturing capabilities of creating such a big optic is not there with the other companies. So they have uh, like a lenslet which are partial field optics through which the laser is fired. Whereas with the size… We can size, go up to 8 uh, or 8.5 I so think. Yeah, not the zone. 
Uh, I'm talking of both. Uh, like this. No, it's uh, the optics. I'm talking about the optics. Optics of the laser. Of the laser, okay. Optics so of the laser, how does that it's partial field. Whereas Zeiss is the only laser which has a full field. So, when the spots transition between the lenslets, yes. there can be some irregularity and that's what Zeiss says. Okay. With there, it's like a single optic. That's why the Zeiss laser is very heavy compared to the other lasers also because it's got a very large full field uh, optics. But again, regarding the spot size, one, one in, even with the Zeiss, you can do a 1 into 1.5 micron and then the, you can just pull out the lenticule. It comes out very easily. But the whole thing is that the visual recovery on day one, if when you use a very small track and spot spacing is not as good. We tried different spot spacing, right, from 1 micron to 4.5 microns and we found that the best was 4.5 No, but were you, wearing, were you wearing the spot size also? We are wearing the spot and the track. Okay. And okay. then we, we, we use multiple com, uh, combinations. We looked at the scatter also. Because when you look at the scatter, you know the quality of vision. But aren't these spot sizes kind of fixed for machines? How can you no, vary No, no, you can spot? vary it. I don't know. Some machines it may be fixed, but in the size you can vary it. 500? With 800. No, not with the 500. 500 also you yeah, can vary. In the but not size. size. Not as much. I think 500 you can just go you up to… You can vary the, uh, uh, the spot separation and the line separation. Yes. But not the spot size per se. That's not the spot size. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Spot, spot size. size. Only, the, only the spot spacing and the line I spacing. I agree. Spot spacing and line separation can be separated. That we have been doing. That's to optimize the energy. But the spot size is fixed for spot a machine. Spot size so is fixed for so all that's all what I'm saying. The spot size I think for Zeiss is 4. This is… Uh, it's 4 microns, this no, spot the size. No, the spot size basically depends because it's like the plasma which expands. No, no, that's uh, the expansion but the spot that actually hits. So, basically that's what I'm telling the J&J &J guys that if you are having like typically what you have is a 4 micron spot <coughs> for Zeiss and a 4 micron separation. So, that's for the plasma to expand. Here they are giving no space between 1 micron and 1 micron. So, what I'm telling them for a 1 micron spot, please give 1 micron se uh, separation. <laughs> There is a technical problem in doing a line separation, but a spot separation can happen and that I am going to start pretty soon to see because that will further reduce the energy level. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I go on or any question? Yeah. So, let's talk about the silk experience. So, this is the elite of femtosecond laser, smooth as silk is what they say. Uh, this is the uh, side though, yaar. Kya ho? Aani rahi? Okay, so this is the uh, uh, Elita smooth as silk and this is the uh, machine as it looks. So, those who have seen the interlace, this is uh, far more compact than the interlace and there are two screens on it, one here for the surgeon and this is here for your… <coughs> this is there for the assistant. Now, what you see here is that it gives uh, as the flap as I told you in 16.6 seconds. It is an ultra precise pulse which you can see continuous surface scanning. So, this you can see is that a continuous surface scanning. So, it scans the surface continuously and you have a 1 micron spot which is there and this sub micron precision is got because of the high numerical aperture focusing optics. So, this is very very important and there is also a auto Z detector which is there and multi channel uh, beam splitter. So, what this does is that you can get very small spots absolutely uniform and where you want them to be placed. So, this is what they, the engineers of uh, J&J claim to be there. Now, if you compare the Elita with the IFS, you can see that the pulse duration has gone down to about an average of only 150 femtoseconds. So, that's the fastest, the shortest pulse that you are having. Pulse frequency is very high which is 10 megahertz. The spot size as I told you is only 1.3 microns. The wavelength is 1040 as we know. So, if we compare the Visumax, uh, this is the comparison with the Visumax 500, not with the 800 and IFS. So, from a 600, 800 uh, which is femtosecond uh, which is the intralase, you have gone down to only about an average of about 150 femtoseconds that is there and the pulse energy is significantly down and this is actually the lowest pulse energy that uh, goes 
uh, in the Alita system as compared to any other system. So, what is the thought process? The thought process is that supposing you have a paper like this and you have say a 4 micron separation and you have a paper like this where you have a 1, 1 micron uh, separation, just a simple uh, kind of uh, description. So, you see it's a postage stamp, if it is not perforated properly, you will see that the dissection is going to be requiring something uh, which you may not see when you are doing a one micron uh, 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 which is coming next to each other. So, smooth le incision lenticular extraction is considered to be a next generation lenticular procedure. Indications are up to minus 12. Uh, uh, with some end sphere of cylinder uh, going up to 12 minus 1 to minus 12 minus cylinder you can go up to 6. Uh, biconvex lenticule is something that we will be talking about. 16 seconds what it takes and cyclotorsion and docking centration are there. This is the same video that I showed you where uh, I showed you that you can center as also you can do a cyclotorsion adjustment. This is the removal. Now when we did the, the study was based on the first thing in the study was to start and see that a flap is doable. So that was started in 2018 and then there was energy optimization the thing and we got as good flaps as we got with the interlays, actually better looking flaps but statistically the visual outcome was not any different between what you had with the interlays versus this. Then on 5th of Jan uh, January when the COVID had struck it was really difficult and uh, it was online 6-7 cameras from uh, US, East Coast, West Coast and uh, Delhi that we were able to do this. So uh, first phase we looked at uh, amblyopic patients. Uh, and we would take uh, patients and see whether the lenticule was doable or not. That's the first thing and then we looked at the vision outcome and then on we went to one eye at a time and the, then we went on to both eyes at a time and now uh, there's a limited market release with some people that you can do it clinically any place which is there. These are the normal indications, contraindications which is there. So these are the study design. I will uh, the started out in Center for Site Delhi and then went on to NN and now uh, there are multiple sites in Europe as also in uh, uh, Hong Kong as also in uh, Korea which are uh, giving out the data and the main endpoints were the MRSC, the UCVA and the B uh, best corrected spectacle visual equity. Now when you look at the study results, uh, surgeons rated the ease of lenticular removal as no or mild dissection. So basically if it is less than 25% uh, requirement over an area, we would call it as no and uh, mild would be less than 50% requiring dissection. So you can see that the dissection uh, requirement was uh, absolutely minimal, that's one thing. So that is why we never had any retained lenticules. Uncorrected visual equity of 2020 or better was got in 96% of the patient at six months and it is uh, uh, higher still when we are looking at one year. So there is very little case of regression. We have not retreated any one of them. And the MRSC was within plus minus 0.5 in 91% of the eyes uh, at six months. Subjects were slightly undercorrected on average and as Shri also knows that uh, there was a nomogram adjustment that we did for these eyes. Similarly, there is a nomogram adjustment 1 and nomogram adjustment 2 that we have done on the uh, Elita system, whereas there is a slight overcorrection of point, minus 0.25 plus 10 percent of uh, what it is. So you can see here, this is the intended versus achieved that you see. So there is an undercorrection as you are seeing. And uh, uh, this is the phase 3 as you can see it is only in the uh, uh, higher myopes that we are having the undercorrection and now we have also done a second nomogram adjustment in which the results even for high myopia are tighter. So there is by far in majority of the lenticules a slight undercorrection which you have to do a nomogram adjustment. So now this is a standard nomogram that we are having. Uh, every nomogram is actually based on the Mullerian formula. So there is one uh, wrong concept that uh, lenticules take uh, more thickness as compared to eczema. No. The only place where lenticule take more thickness is that you have to have a flat head or a table which may be about 10 microns. So in a, in a one diopter or two diopters which really doesn't matter, you may be actually making the lenticule about 40 to 50 microns as a minimum thickness to actually work on it. But normally when you're going to 6, 7, 8, it uh, translates to only 2 microns or something per, more per, per diopter. So this is at 9 months, you have 90% of the eyes MRSC within plus minus half and 94% at 12 months. So this was in the phase 1, phase 2 as we have gone on. Easy and smooth lenticular extraction was 91% uh, of the patients that you had. 
this is just to show you the post op uh, cornea clarity on day one and one of the things which uh, nn has worked upon and this is a chinese paper is that because of the lenticule being curved uh, sorry the uh, the patient interface being curved uh, the the way the uh, whole lenticule is taken out in a plano convex is that there are uh, these micro distortions that happen uh, in the bowmans and they persist up to three years for myopia and this causes uh, what is known as uh, the scatter and a drop in the visual equity. Uh, the confocal microscope with the uh, bi biconvex uh, lenticule that has been made, you know that all camera lenses etc. are biconvex lenses because they induce the least amount of abrasions. So having a biconvex lenticule makes much more sense than uh, it is. The other thing is that if you are having a plano lenticule, plano convex, it will cut the nerves right at the start of the plane. But when you are having like a knob which is coming, so the nerves uh, go and again and then uh, uh, has done some studies to say that Though the dry eye induction is less in lenticules, it is still less as compared to uh, Visumax uh, in the smile patients. And this is to show you the mean higher order abrasions uh, again, which has been shown that the induction, this is by Rushad Shroff, uh, that the induction is much less uh, uh, in the lenticule based procedure of the Alita. It has not been compared with the, um, uh, with the Visumax, but this uh, overall the induction of uh, abrasions uh, are much less when you are looking at a biconvex lenticule which is there. My personal impression is that uh, the silk lives up to its uh, name of smooth incision lenticular keratomyliosis with minor or no tissue adhesions. All cases had complete lenticular uh, removal as I told you. <coughs> Just if you keep the cornea moist before firing the laser you do not get any cold spots and any uncut areas. Plane identification is relatively very easy, going entry into the side cut is perfect because it goes like uh, you are putting a knife through hot butter. Uh, corneal biomicroscopy was unremarkable on day one, visual equity was pretty good. Uh, most of our cases and at NN, uh, uh, more than 90% uh, of the cases are getting 2020 vision day one. Uh, refractive correction is pretty accurate, tight outcomes and uh, patient satisfaction uh, on the Prowl questionnaire was uh, found to be more than 97% of the patients giving a satisfaction rate that they are happy with the procedure. Future developments as we know from a two-piece PI within the next six months or eight months, you never know with these trials, the docking trials are on in US and then it will come to us to use a single-piece PI. So it will be similar to the Visumax, a single-piece PI. The second thing is hyperopia which is going to be there, that's and then a rescue flap uh, which may be required in the thing. Uh, I don't think engineerically it may be possible because there are both are refractive surfaces that you can go and cut into the same refractive convex surface if you do suction <coughs> uh, at uh, uh, before uh, uh, in these particular cases uh, that you can restart or redock a lenticule at the same time. So these are what we expect to happen over time and further energy optimization is something I think and the results and nomograms would be the other things which will make this machine perfect. So that's all that I'll wish to say. Thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. This is just um, tips and pearl for outcomes, our proper instrument identifying the plane. The only difference is in a plano convex you can actually go in like this, here you have to go in like this because it's a biconvex surface so that's the plane identification which is there and otherwise uh, head position is important because you don't want the nose sticking in and uh, good centration and cyclotorsion compensation should be done by marking properly. So this is the uh, new generational leap I would say in corneal refractive surgery with outstanding patient uh, outcomes, highly accurate flap thickness. Uh, with stru smooth stromal beds and easy lifts and uh, lenticule is performing pretty well. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Any questions? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, we have done minus 0.5 sphere with 4.5 uh, this thing and uh, in two eyes uh, of the same patient, in one eye he was 20-20, in the other eye there was a residual cylinder of about uh, one or something like that, point seven five. but the results are… See the only thing is that we don't have a plus minus. If you have a, <coughs> a compound power, 
uh, the nomogram doesn't allow you to treat, but uh, we are doing uh, high cylinders. Uh, I was even with the Visumax 500 after marking and changing the alignment, I was doing it. Uh, he has done a study and I am not apprehensive if, uh, in doing high cylinders in the Silkia. If ahead. you have a pure cylinder, then you cannot treat it with smile. You need yeah. a minimum of 0.5 sphere 0 .5. in the commercial software. But in the non-commercial software, I have treated pure cylinders also. I have also done mixed astigmatism. We have the first results which we have submitted to IGO for publication for mixed astigmatism, smile for mixed astigmatism and results are fairly good. Uh, so you can do astigmatism, it's not that you can't do, but you need to have the cyclotorsion compensation, then you get better results. So that's what he, like he said, that uh, you need a minimum 0.5, you can't do if you are plus minus. And the, the other clarification about micro distortions <coughs> in the Bowman's, I think it's more of your technique of removing the lenticule, because when you put an instrument and you're actually pushing it, around, then you actually stretch the Bowman's. When you stretch the Bowman's, you have Bowman's folds. So irrespective of which laser you use, if you're stretching the Bowman's, you will get Bowman's folds. Now if your dissection is very good, you're not pushing against the edge there, then you will not get in. I have no, a technique, she, I described the, the a technique of no dissection, where you just pull out the lenticule, and in that we don't see any, because even with, uh, some of them have described ironing of the uh, cap and all that, but I don't do any ironing. And if you look at my OSIs on day one, it's less than 1.5. I showed you some examples, it's like 0.6. So when you have microfolds in the Bowman's, that increases the scatter and reduces the quality of vision. But again, I think it is about your energy optimization and your surgical technique more than the interface. So, but the point is that these, uh, this study out of China and there are other, which is, this is three years post-surgery. A study is, again, it, it depends on the methodology, right? If they have used dissection and then if the dissection is rough, then you will get micro folds. Okay, but suffice to say that these micro folds are uh, important for uh, reducing the quality of vision and uh, that uh, if <coughs> he has satisfactory evidence to say that uh, it's totally dependent on the dissection techniques then that's and the energy levels and that's uh, really good. What I feel is that how much dissection you need to do is very significant because <coughs> if you have very little uh, regions then you will not do much yeah. dissection and then the folds and all such uh, you know, uh, irregularities in the interface are much less. So Thank you very much Dr. Bharti. I think uh, uh, we can ask him. I, I call him the godfather of refractive surgery. Uh, in India because he was after uh, uh, Dr. Hardia, I think he was uh, the pioneer in doing a lot of RKs and uh, then he was among the first to get the ALK uh, which uh, when the first patient came to me in RP center I said, yeah, kia kia, is the cornea pe? but uh, that's uh, where he is, he's been really great in uh, innovations and technology and then Eximer also, he was the first adapter in LASIK also, so over to Dr. Bharti. Thank you, Maipal. Thanks uh, to the um, AIOS for gi giving me this opportunity and uh, thanks Shri Ganesh. Um, I'll be showing the new uh, technology. So what you have heard about is the masters, master surgeons. But uh, what I am talking about is the fantastic machine. I'm using this system for more than 15 years and I've been investigator for them and now this clear system is what uh, is the new uh, lenticule extraction method which I have been investigating, doing the research and giving them the, my data and this is the uh, this is what I'm using for the last four years or maybe. So clear is clear lenticule extraction for advanced refractive correction by Zimmer, Switzerland. And uh, of course it is flapless. The, the initial machine had adjustable centration. It's a very low vacuum system. It has got a guiding tunnel system for gas bubble venting which does not allow any accumulation of gas in the central area. There are multiple incision options, one in the anterior plane and the other in the uh, posterior plane. 
and there is interoperative OCT like other machines. The beauty is the overlapping spot scan, uh, scan pattern which gives absolutely no tissue adhesions and uh, it's a very low energy system. So there is hardly any heating or uh, you know damage to the adjacent tissues. Now this is how we start. Uh, we start the vacuum here and once the vacuum is reached then you can center the lenticule like this earlier now it is auto centration auto cyclotorsion correction was there since very beginning you have to just mark at 180 degree and then there are two ports one is going into the anterior plane and the second one going into the posterior plane and then you can go in this plane without much difficulty you can enter and this is the overlapping spot scatter, uh, scan pattern where uh, the focus size is so small the, the, the separation is hardly there and there is hardly any tissue adhesions in the, in the plane so that it is very easy to separate. So this is like uh, you can go into anterior and posterior plane like I, like I explained but later on once you get the hang of it then you can have one small incision, incision of opening of 2 millimeter and go in both, into both the planes. There is hardly any uh, resistance to you know separation and the lenticule can be pulled out very very comfortably. So this is how you go ahead and start and if you notice here this is my one of my first cases where I am correcting minus four and a half cylinder so astigmatism is not a matter now and I am not using examined laser at all for any kind of astigmatism which is there of course myopic astigmatism and here I can you know depending upon what kind of incision opening we want we can have anterior posterior both and then it's the centration. Once you have docked, you put the and pupil is once you have docked, the pupil is automatically captured. There is no need to uh, you know center the whole thing and again 180, 0, 180 axis is marked. So there is always uh, uh, one it, uh, the axis is cyclotorsion is compensated and then these are the two guidance terminals. So first the posterior lenticule uh, plane is uh, uh, cut with the laser. Initially this used to take 35 seconds, now it is down to 25 and very soon it will be 15 seconds for both. So it will be a matter of 15 seconds to cut the complete lenticule. This is the posterior plane and then from here we will start with the green uh, you know, color. You will see the cut in the anterior um, uh, uh, plane and once this has done completely then there is a post OCT, the after the laser correction there is a OCT which uh, shows as to what is the lenticule cut anterior posterior is there anything any issue with that or not and this is the lenticule which you can see on the OCT we have done with it now we don't need it anymore but earlier uh, we used to you know kind of use it all the time. Now I will show you this is when you have done the docking and as soon as you have docked the vacuum and the machine has captured then there is auto detection of the pupil, auto detection of the astigmatism, you know cyclotorsion correction and then as I have showed you in the previous uh, uh, picture there is this, the cut in the posterior plane followed by the cut in the anterior plane. So this is all done very quickly as I have shown earlier and this, this spot uh, you can appreciate that there is hardly any, any uh, you know difference in the cut. This is the OCT which is uh, 
going to come and this is the picture on the microscope and uh, I am capturing it from the television screen. So this is the single entry port and here you just separate it and go into the entire plane first completely and then go into the posterior plane and once you have dissected the posterior plane you will be able to appreciate the meniscus which is there so that you know you are going into the posterior plane and this is the round spatula dissector and you can see how easy it is to separate the lenticule the anterior and the posterior planes you see this is very important not to separate the periphery uh, in the uh, lenticule because as soon as you separate the periphery the lenticule tends to you know fold upon itself so remain in the center initially and then once you have completely separated the center then you separate the you know edge and as, as soon as you separate the edge you have seen that the lenticule starts you know folding upon itself and it is very very easy to uh, separate the lenticule and take it out as you can see and here you can spread to see there is no portion of the lenticule which is left inside because that causes a lot of inflammation as well as astigmatism so this is the these are the few things that we must remember a couple of things which i want to mention here easier dissection causes less inflammation and nearly 6 by 6 uh, vision in nearly 100% of your cases next day after 24 hours so that is what my results are and uh, I have given all my data of first 200 eyes and then 4 500 eyes one by one to Zimmer to analyze and this is the software which has come after the data given by me and then it, the, the whole um, uh, product was the software was launched internationally and now it is available now after using Visumax 500 and 800 and being investigator for uh, Visumax for such a long time Shri Gadesh has also started using Z8 so that is that is what the Z8 is all about that and I have been using smile in my own other center for more than 11 years and now I have realized and I am using in the other center I am using Visumax 500 in this center I am using the uh, Z8 which works very well uh, for cataract for keratoplasty for uh, for um, uh, flap and for lenticule extraction and there is no need to have a, a circle software because we already have a uh, uh, the lamellar keratoplasty software which you can use it for a if there is any need to lift the flap you can always make a lamellar keratoplasty flap thickness of 160 microns and then lift the flap and do a examine laser correction if there is a possible uh, in any case you need it though I have not had done that but I was talking about circle software and other things and we came to the conclusion that we can always do a lamellar uh, cut so that we can lift the flap uh, there is no problem on that so uh, this is the I think this surpasses all the current femto platforms as far as lenticule system is concerned thank you thank you Dr. Bhai. are there any questions for Dr. Bhatia otherwise we will go to the next speaker I think Dr. Kudlu has to go to another session so I invite him to talk on uh, his personal experience with EMV.
thank you sir for the opportunity so there is some uh, loose connection so i'll be talking about my personal experience with the e ambulances from rainar for no financial interest for this particular talk so as we all know that uh, natural crystalline lens has got good accommodation clear vision at all distance a uh, clear vision in all lighting condition with a greater contrast sensitivity with no rotational asymmetry so however the aging and also dysfunctional lens does not compensate for the corneal aberration but the one good news is the newer iols has shown a admirable ambition in overcoming this can you able to get me the connector from other hall please so this is about the evolution of the mo monofocal iol we started with pmma then we have gone to do the silicon then acrylic in acrylic both hydrophilic and hydrophobic then comes the square edge then comes the spheric iol so what what should be the ideal monofocal intraocular lens it should give a very clear optical quality uncompromised vision for distance it should compensate for the spherical aberration on the cornea easy to implant and also pco protection glistening free and minimal incision size with a lesser inflammation so now the question which is the best iol for you whether hydrophilic or hydrophobic again some people compare on depending upon the which iol really causes a lesser pco formation so also the you should know also without disadvantage of multifocal iol so coming to the pco probably the most common complication of a modern cataract surgery uh, basically this uh, post capsular opacification is a multifactorial uh, again it is depending upon your surgical technique and type of iol material so all these factors there are people say that there is a the equatorial cells come to the center that causes pco again the dissociation of each factor is almost impossible and dif difficult to differentiate what exactly is the cause for pco so coming to the design you will have optic design edge profile and haptic material but what final goal goal that lens has to be have a minimization of the decentration minimization of the dislocation minimal optical abrasion and op opacification there is sorry for the inconvenience request speakers to keep up to the timing we just have 10 more minutes we need to wrap up this session by 10:30 fine so probably a square edge on the posterior surface of the lens provides a barrier for lens epithelial cells to migrating from periphery to the center so always sharp edge always better than the round edge with the lesser angulation so coming to the glistening i think there is nothing but the fluid filled micro vacuoles within the iol matrix normally can be seen as or less even one week also but most of the lens shows glistening but which is much lesser with the hydrophilic iol one of the iol i think acris of iq showed the highest glistening effect but as we all know that glistening will not harbor the vision but definitely there is a gross reduction in the contrast sensitivity so coming to the refractive index hydrophobic acrylic always associates the study shows that associated with the more pseudophagic dysphotopsia than the other material maybe even related to their higher refractive index and flatter the anterior curvature as well as untreated and also with the truncated intraocular lens edges but hydrophilic on contrary hydrophilic acrylic lenses have more closely mimic biologic tissue due to their higher water content which ranges between 18 to 34 percent that might be the reason for lesser glare and halos and abrasions coming to the aspheric iol what should be the ideal aspheric iol where the idea of aspheric iol is to return the eye to the youthful optics the young eye has got a zero spherical abrasion but as the age progresses this spherical abrasion increases with the functional vision so let me come to the main talk about my today talk this is the special lens that is emb lens enhanced monofocal lens from rainer it has got a spheric anterior surface and a unique inner optic design but the central region they created with the 
controlled positive spherical aberration to have a extended depth of vision it has got a blended edge that reduces the longitudinal spherical aberration to maintain the visual acuity and contrast sensitivity under low light condition and very importantly these lenses are non diffractive design that reduces the dysphotopsia so it is a patented product they carefully they have put a positive spherical aberration in the center of the optic so it does not use the diffractive or light splitting optics so there is no more dysphotopsia compared to any of the standard multifocal intraocular lens and uh, it also works together with the natural positive spherical aberration on the cornea that helps for the patient so this will be like always helpful especially if you have got a slight tilt also after implantation or even with the it takes care about the decentration when compared to the equivalent negative spherical aberration in the different lenses the these are the other properties because of this positive spherical aberration you get the increased range focus up to 1.5 adapter so high quality of vision no dysphotopsia Well, there is again it is called as enhanced monofusion the normally patient will have a continuous range of vision and also nowadays it even available in toric platform so coming to the one more feature of this intraocular lens it is a vacuum free material so it's a single piece uh, normally uh, it can go through the micro incision but uh, the other very good feature even it is you you can even put a Uh, post rd surgery also because of its low silicon oil adherence excellent evl com uh, biocompatibility and as we all know that hydrophilic acrylic material with a low inflammatory response and average offset is almost 0.08 in 3 to 6 months that you have to observe so the one more advantage with these lenses this is a sort of a hybrid material with a hydrophilic with a hydrophobic surface with a 360 degree anti pco so that causes like the incidence of pco is almost less so if you compare the different lenses in the market i, I think if you can see i think definitely renner raven will have a much edges as far as the pco is concerned glistening is concerned even abbe value is much higher than any other lens refractive index is also lower there is 1.46 and mean decentration as i told 0.08 and of course injecting system is very very easy to use it's coming in a fully preloaded system from the factory so easy to inject also this is a very small video i think i am not showing you the fake part probably we all know that renar is the first company to discover the first intraocular lens has been discovered by renar they have been innovative in year by year but this is the new lens i have used in a very big number i am very happy with these lenses this is about the injecting system straight away like uh, the whole injecting system is within the saline they preserve it nicely there is a small hole there you have to in, uh, inject the viscoelastic then lock it it go through almost uh, 2 mm incision also and wound assisted 1.8 and you need not have to do any manipulation just st start injecting the lens straight away into the bag viscoelastic removal is very very important in any of this uh, premium eye so coming to the up. sir i am finishing only one this is about the defocus curve is very good so this is our study we have done around 300 eyes with em and 50 eyes with emb tori more than 98% having a comfortable monocular distance vision 66 94% have intermediate n12 at 40 cm none of these patient presented with glare starbursts halos and follow up in uh, up to 90 days follow up none of the patient had any residual toric refraction after usage of toric em lenses and uh, the we make non dominant eye little bit myopic by 0.5 adapter so that patient will have very good near vision in conclusion these newer monofocal lenses are marketed as a premium mono focal lenses they give 20 to 30% intermediate vision compared to the pure extended depth i use best for people with the driving and working with computer with no glare enhanced mono vision can increase the depth of field can provide spectacle independence for distance intermediate vision and with some patients with near vision also raven emv toric is promising in your alpha same without a very good rotational stable platform once again i thank sri ganesh sir for this opportunity thank, thank you uh, dr kodlu and uh, we are running short of time so we can't take any questions i would like to invite uh, dr sharat uh, babu to speak on uh, trifocals for presbyopia correct yeah good morning uh, all so uh, today i am going to discuss about the presbyopia correction with trifocals which i have been doing from very long time and uh, uh, why trifocals this because 
now the need for the uh, use on the computers and the mobile or the tablets the need has increased so there is a rapid shift like uh, the earlier we were doing the bifocals but now there is a need for the trifocals so that is the intermediate vision has become uh, more important in everybody's life <coughs> so the the routine near vision is 40 centimeters the intermediate goes from between 40 to 80 centimeters and the bifocals what we were uh, iOS what we were using was uh, there for the distance and for the near that is 40 centimeters early but now the range of uh, vision what everybody requires is between 40 to 80 centimeters and that's what uh, Dr. Kutli is talking about the uh, enhanced mono vision for the intermediate vision. So uh, when the uh, this is the trifocal technology as I was uh, uh, discussing like there is a first generation the second generation and the second generation they have the up to 80 centimeters not only 60 up to 80 centimeters. So the different trifocals in the market which I've been using is the Panoptics, the Optiflex from the Biotech, the Acriva Trinova, and the latest one is the Vivinex Geometric and Geometric Plus. So in, in our experience what we found out is it's the first the material and the make and how it is being uh, uh, planned. So the Panoptics, it is the most popular one what we have been using. It's the amount of uh, uh, the light which goes into the the transmission that's what is uh, we say that is what is more important uh, which gives the a uh, clear vision in the daytime and in the night both mesopic and uh, photopic vision so it's 88 percent of the vision and it's the sizes are the same 13 mm 6 mm and the low incidence of tilt but that all depends upon how you give the ccc and uh, the placement of the eye oil so the intermediate vision is as i was talking the near point is 42 and 62 centimeters and it is uh, pupil independent. The reason is they, they have made it uh, so well that uh, it features a 4.5 mm diffractive zone and they found out the diffractive zone of 4.5 mm is ideal uh, for everyone to have a good vision for both distance in intermediate and near. And as uh, the discussion is the Clarion Panoptics Trifocal is the latest. The material is uh, the hydroxyethyl methacrylate which has been incorporated and it gives no uh, glistenings in the eye well like previous the IQ lens. So this is the latest material which uh, most of the eye oils companies have come out with and their uh, results are really good. And uh, it has got uh, the tauric component also. The anterior surface is aspheric diffractive and the posterior, even the tauric is on the posterior side. Uh, the exceptional highlight utilization is the key and the colors what uh, the patient sees are the true colors. I've implanted my sister and one eye with the other uh, uh, eye well, the symphony, the second eye I implanted this uh, panoptics and she sees the true colors with the panoptics and uh, uh, this is more suitable for the software professionals and in the recent uh, past we have been doing the clear lens extractions for the young uh, the professionals where we couldn't do the refractive surgeries, uh, the, the, the corneal surgeries and uh, the results are uh, exceptionally well appreciated by them. And in their, my experience, it is the uh, few experience of dysphotopus in the first few months, but after that they are fine. And I'll skip the surgery, we'll go to the next eye oil, that's the Biotech Optiflex. This is again an eye oil with the equal uh, uh, competent uh, technology. It has got the aspheric uh, and the tauric on the uh, posterior and the diffractive surface and the anterior. And uh, the near vision and uh, distance are more uh, very good for uh, the near vision is 3.5. And this eye oil is the most popular eye oil for the people who have a lot of reading and uh, the light distribution is 45 percent of our intermediate 27, 28 and uh, in our experience we, uh, we recommend this eye oil for all the teachers and for all the people who have a lot of uh, reading, uh, 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 reading habits. And the next one is the Acriva Trinova. It is a sinusoidal eye oil. The steps are more smooth and uh, the um, and the MTF results are really good and even a little bit of astic medicine up to one diopter or 1.25 diopter also the vision is good for both distance intermediate and near and I am skipping the because lack of the uh, time and it's the Vivinex this is what the geometric and the geometric plus which has been introduced recently they have got two lenses of similar thing both for distance and near and intermediate vision but the geometric plus is we use that for the most of the near vision who has got a most of the reading habits and because it has it takes the 
uh, more of light transmission is more for near in this eye wall. So we can mix, uh, mix and match in both eyes, one in each eye, or we can do, depending upon the profession, we keep changing the uh, eye wall, but it's the diffractive uh, part is only 3.2 mm, and it is very good in a 3 mm pupil size, and uh, the results are yet to be known because we just started, and after six months, we'll be having uh, the clear-cut uh, uh, advantage of these eye walls in the different population. And uh, the last one is synergy. I have less much uh, less experience with this, uh, but my experience uh, with this eye wheel is not that good because of the uh, most of my patients in the initial stages uh, near vision is not that good. So, uh, but it's an extended depth of focus eye wheels. A few of them are really good for the people who have a uh, lot of uh, uh, work for the distance and intermediate vision, and it's got a uh, different uh, properties. That is the uh, the diffractive part in the posterior side. It's a breakthrough technology, and of course I'm skipping the thing. And uh, the most common things what we encounter is the dysphotopias, positive and the negative dysphotopias, and the halos, and which we should be very careful uh, while implanting the eye wall. We need to have a lot of chair time um, with the patient, and then understand what exactly they do. And uh, night driving is one thing we should ask very clearly. We, we don't know which patients experience all this. So we avoid this uh, 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 trifocals for these patients and then go for the extended depth of focus eye wheels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Partha Biswas to speak on Fikik eye wheel. So when the going goes tough, the tough get going. So he's going to talk on tough calls. <laughs> and he has only two minutes. <laughs> How many seconds? So that's two minutes. Two I minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So that's again a tough call. <laughs> so tough situations uh, in two minutes. Uh, yes, sizing, high vault, low vault. These are tough situations in the fake eye well panorama, and uh, we definitely need to see them and uh, look into uh, this. So post-operative intraocular pressure rise is another uh, situation that comes in upside down ICL, a damaged ICL, when to take it out and when maybe you can leave it behind, lens touch with cataract formation and uh, this is when to take out the cataract, when to remove the cataract and the ICL of course, post-operative glare, pigment dispersion, rotation of a toric ICL when it has already been placed and uh, these are small quick videos that I'm going to share with you and uh, look at this video in which uh, the haptic has got stuck to the applicator. So one has to be very, very gentle when such a situation happens. It can happen once in a while when the applicator is actually squeezing on the haptic. But it has to be dealt very carefully, otherwise even this very pliable ICL can tear. And if a torn haptic is there, then it can become a difficult situation. Now look at this mid-dilated ICL. It was not dilating despite drops being put for a very long time. So we had to uh, put in the ICL. It has to be very, very gentle. And if it is gently placed and the haptics have to go in, so the first haptics that need to go in is the uh, haptics that have gone in first, that is on the nasal side. And then this part has to be taken in very, very gently without damaging or minimal damage to the pupil. Remembering the fact that visco would have gone under the, uh, the pupil and that is why the prolapse is there. So weaning of the viscoelastic from under the pupil is something that is very important and uh, because that, that trauma to that part of the iris will ever stay on till the end of his days for this uh, person. The stuck ICL is again uh, a half a nightmare if it is stuck like this and if it is there lodged in the main port then that is when you have to be very patient, very gentle and very quick as well that this does not flip wrong side up. 
So if it does, then of course we have a, a big problem. And uh, in this patient, of course, we uh, supported it with the spatula from one side and gradually we placed in the ICL very gradually inside so that it comes on the right side up. In these cases, there's always a very high chance that it can somersault and come the wrong side up. And then you have to pull out the ICL and replace it again. So it has to be very gently done, viscoelastic if required from the side port, from the main port, but supporting the ICL so that it is the right side up. <clears throat> Now, a toric, uh, um, this patient, uh, you know, came back about six months later and he had sustained a thin trauma and you can see that uh, the toric ICL has rotated and off its axis totally. So here you have to be a little careful. It's not difficult to re-rotate the lens to the right axis, but you have to remember the fact that there's no viscoelastic cover between the ICL and the crystalline lens and here huge amount of gentleness otherwise you might end up in damaging the crystalline lens which is uh, just below it and uh, the vault even if it is adequate might impinge on the anterior capsular surface. So it can uh, be done very well but very very gently and this uh, again gives back a very good vision to the patient. ICL exchange, I think uh, this is a very important aspect in which one has to remember that when required, the ICL exchange can, uh, might have to be done. Here, our ICL exchange, the requirement was of a very low vault. So, a low vault of less than 100 microns, 100% 100 has to be removed. And uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, technique in which we are following. The haptics on the temp in the, in the nasal side are still in the sulcus. We, you need to prolapse out the temporal haptics and then remove it so that the angulation of the ICL is very pro to the main uh, port. And then all that you have to do is pull it out with the forceps and then hand over hand technique in which you remove the ICL. The, the next ICL or the corrected ICL is replaced inside uh, the, in the anterior chamber and uh, in the sulcus it goes in. So the last one and I think I will end with this. Uh, uh, this is um, again a one in situation that you might uh, face in once or twice in a lifetime. And, and this was a patient in which we had uh, placed an ICL. There were some treatable lesions in the retina which we had addressed. Uh, but six months down the line, this patient came with a retina detachment and the retina surgeon took it up, uh, did good to the detachment. It settled very well. But what happened is there was a lens touch. And with this lens touch, we ha the, the, the cataractus formation came in and in three months time this was the scenario. So the ICL is there well in the sulcus and uh, we have a near Morgagnian cataract here. So we need to remove uh, the ICL and uh, the same hand and overhand uh, technique to be employed and uh, I think I cannot uh, move out the... So uh, once this is done, the, the more important part is doing a very good rexis for this patient. I wish I could fast forward it a little. Uh, because the rexis has to be very appropriate because we had planned for the single piece lens to go inside this uh, lens, uh, this uh, capsular bag. Now, removal uh, of the ICL uh, is exactly what we showed last time. And uh, once the ICL is removed, so we have placed in uh, viscoelastic. So the viscoelastic is uh, washed over and tripan blue is injected so as to stain the uh, anterior capsule. So once the anterior capsule is stained, we have to be very particular about the rexis that we are going to fashion for this. And uh, that is where I'm going to face the troubles. And uh, once the uh, staining is good, uh, as you can see that uh, the whole uh, viscoelastic is washed off and uh, the stain has come in well. So uh, doing a capsule rexis here, I start off with the side port, uh, but you can see that it is trying to run out and I'm, I'm trying to re remove the intralenticular fluid as much as possible and then going in 
and trying to fashion uh, Rexes as uh, aptly as possible. But here I face trouble and uh, the trouble is, I should have preempted the trouble also because as you could see that initially there were some areas of synechia there and that synechia is where there would have been additions and uh, here I'm not able to get the rexis and the rexis runs out in two places. So we have a bag that does not have a proper anterior capsular rexis, it has run out, we have to remove this lens Again, remembering the fact that there has been a lens touch, that means there could be a deficiency in the posterior capsule as well. So, removal of the cortical matter and uh, the, the nucleus is not difficult, we remove it. I think we have just more, two more minutes, I think, of this. And what we uh, definitely had apprehended, that there would be a plaque that would be sitting right in the center. And you can see that plaque that is sitting in the, right in the center. So we have to do something about that plaque, otherwise this patient is not going to get good vision or whatever vision um, can happen at this uh, circumstance. So what we do is we place in viscoelastic and then with the MVR uh, blade, we, uh, first with, of course, we place in the three-piece lens. We had planned for a single piece, but a single piece in a capsule that has run out is not the right thing to do. So we place in the three-piece lens very, very gently and uh, the haptic of the lens could have gone inside the bag and, or outside the bag for all that we know. But it is a stable situation when the lens is uh, placed in the sulcus or in the bag. But what we have to do is to remove that part of the uh, plaque that is there and we do that with the MVR blade. The MVR blade is a very sharp blade. It goes right and punctures in and then with the vitrector we uh, create a small uh, opening in the posterior capsule. Remembering the fact that if the vitrector goes beyond this plaque it might totally run out and because the rexis, uh, anterior capsular rexis has already run out, it can coincide with the anterior capsular rexis and uh, the whole bag complex can uh, go down. So here uh, we are creating this uh, small approximately 2.5 to 3 millimeter of opening in the plaque and that suffices for this patient. Patient gets back approximately to 6 by 24 and 12 vision, which is uh, a, a vision that we were not expecting also. So uh, these are situations where you have to uh, open up your mind, you have to think out of the box and do what is necessary in that particular circumstance. Thank you very much for your Thank you, Dr. Sharing. Partha. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, uh, the chair and the delegates uh, for the session. Thank you very much.